Becoming a philosopher, I don't think, is something one sort of starts out in life with. Maybe so. In my case, I sort of uh, fell into it a bit. Um, when I was in college was the sort of end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. It was a sort of strident time, and uh, people were interested in big questions and um, had to sort of take a stand on issues. I'm sure that had, uh, had part of it. Um, Another part was um, that as a teenager, uh, I read Ayn Rand, um, and uh, she sort of argued that philosophy was important. I'm not sure I quite understood exactly why back then, but it seemed right to me. Again, maybe because of the times people were asking uh, questions. Uh, but I suppose that um, in the end, uh, I just liked my philosophy classes when I started taking them as an undergraduate. Uh, I was a pre-law major, and um, a good pre-law major was philosophy, at least that's what they said back then. I think it's still probably true, uh, but I found myself more and more interested in the philosophy classes, and then when I graduated, I had a choice of graduate school or, or going into business with uh, the family, and um, I chose to continue on with philosophy. undergraduate, a double major in philosophy and political science, then I went to political science department at University of Chicago, mainly to do political theory, political philosophy, uh, and then I wanted to sort of, uh, I saw myself teaching philosophy as, as being more interesting to me than teaching political science, so then I moved from political science to a philosophy department and got a PhD in philosophy, uh, focusing on the history of philosophy. Um, I think that's a, that's a good question. I mean, um, a liberal society, like any society, may need some philosophy just so people understand uh, the nature of the system that they're living in, understand uh, perhaps the values that underlie it, uh, the principles that it contains, and philosophy is certainly a good way of doing that. Liberalism, uh, to me, has even more reason to pay attention to philosophy, partly because liberalism is not a philosophy of life. It's a political system, a social legal system, and, and because of that, understanding what its limitations are and the need to have uh, more to life than just respecting people's rights, I think gives philosophy actually more importance in a liberal order than it does in, in other liberal orders where the, the pretense, if not the reality, is that uh, somehow the political order is the whole order uh, in one's life. And that's not the liberal message. The political order isn't the whole of one's life. So it seems to me, apart from trying to defend liberalism as, as a system, philosophy as a way of life becomes more important, it seems to me, in a liberal order than other orders. Actually, to, to uh, answer that question, uh, I need to refer to my first book on Spinoza, Power, State, and Freedom, uh, which was a, strictly about Spinoza's political thought. And um, when I did that book, uh, it was really to show uh, that Spinoza was a kind of liberal, uh, in fact, he was a liberal, uh, but not a Lockean liberal. That is, it wasn't a rights-based defense of liberalism. It was an efficacy or power-based defense of liberalism, which I simply found interesting. Uh, and one could argue that it, it was the, the first uh, example of classical liberalism. Um, and that, that thesis is not actually original with me by any means. Uh, there was a book called Spinoza and the Rise of Liberalism that was a book that argued that Spinoza was the first liberal. But I wanted to look into that further, so I focused first on his political theory. Then, uh, a number of years later, when I was asked to write on Spinoza again, um, I wanted to uh, say something about Spinoza as part of the Western canon and why uh, Spinoza would be interesting to somebody today. I start that book again with, with the political stuff and, and try to argue again that uh, if you look at his work, uh, his political writings, uh, he's, he's a liberal. Uh, but I wanted to take it beyond that and explore what he meant by freedom, which is the central notion in Spinoza's ethics and also in Spinoza's politics in a way. What, what does he mean by freedom? 
freedom. And what does a guy who ostensibly uh, believes in determinism and, and no free will and one substance uh, kind of monism, what does freedom look like uh, in his system? So those were philosophical questions that in, intrigued me. Um, but the answers that I end up uh, coming up with uh, are really surprisingly not that far from the kinds of answers one might get uh, by looking at classical ethics and what, what might be called a self-perfectionist uh, ethical theory. So I, I try to make that argument in the book that uh, he's, he's not that different from, from that whole school of thought. I sort of push the metaphysical questions aside for a while and just focus on what a free person would look like uh, in Spinoza's uh, in Spinoza's system, and, and I think it, uh, you get a pretty interesting picture uh, from that. Well, rights are a, uh, in the Lockean approach, rights are a normative concept. Uh, Spinoza specifically says that by right and power I mean the same thing. So in one way you could call it descriptive, if you will. So the argument for liberalism turns out uh, to be one of these arguments that in fact everybody is more greatly empowered under liberalism than they are under any alternative system. Of course, it's somewhat anachronistic to talk about liberalism this way because it's a term that comes up later. Uh, but uh, if you want to call it uh, a free order or something like that, uh, minimal state uh, kind of arrangement, um, that's fine with me. But the interesting uh, thing about uh, the difference, I think, is how far can you get uh, by uh, not having to talk about people's rights? and still get a defense of, of liberalism. Uh, I think it's, it's a kind of unique uh, theory in the history of political thought because uh, everybody sort of went the Lockean route and they see political theory as, as providing essentially normative uh, um, conclusions to arguments. But Spinoza uh, was somewhat suspicious of that whole normative approach and, and wanted a more scientific, a more descriptive w kind of defense, and that's what I think you get with him. I, I see Spinoza as essentially um, a classical or an ancient ethical theorist and, and not a modern one. That is, the fundamental issue in ethics is what sort of person should I make of myself. It's not what are my duties to others. That, that's in there, but that's not the fundamental issue for him. A classical ethicist is somebody who I think is, is asking that first question, which is what kind of person should I make of myself? What are my responsibilities to my own uh, self-development uh, and so forth? And so you get a different kind of approach to ethics, I think, than you do when the first question or the first issue is what do I owe to others or what must I do for others? And basically you get um, an approach which deals a lot more with exemplars, practical examples of virtues, these kinds of things, than you do rules uh, and uh, duties as you might get with the second kind of approach to ethics. So I take classical ethics to be much closer to the first kind than the second kind. Um, well, maybe um, one would argue it doesn't get reconciled, I don't know. Uh, uh, certainly I've had enough discussions with, with people about this. Um, sort of the way I handle it perhaps is something of a cop-out, but by the time you understand the various dimensions of causality in Spinoza, I don't think you get an actor who looks a whole lot different from what sensible free will actors look like either. So, uh, you know, maybe again I'm, I'm sort of pushing the metaphysical question aside a bit and saying, well, yes, as you look at the whole big system, I guess there's no free will. But when you start looking at horizontal and vertical causality and these kinds of things in Spinoza, you begin to realize the agent isn't that much different from uh, agents in other f philosophic theories, uh, let's say like Aquinas and so forth. No, actually, I think uh, as these terms are used today, the duty and the consequentialists are both on the same side of the coin, which is what do I owe to others, and I cash that out either in duty terms or consequentialist terms. What I'm talking about then on the other side or the classical side is really what kind of person should I become, what kind of person should I make of myself, and then I'll understand how I should deal with others in light of that question rather than the reverse.